CEO.ca. My name is James Patton, and today I'm joined by Benjamin Lightburn, CEO and co-founder of Filament Health. Ben, it's great to see you. Thanks for having me on, James. So I wonder if we could kick things off uh, for our viewers who are maybe less familiar with Filament Health. Can you give us you know, a quick overview of the company? Sure. So Filament Health is the leading natural uh, psychedelics manufacturer. Uh, we started Filament a few years ago um, after having sold a company dedicated to making different kinds of natural botanical extracts. And we did so to fill what we thought of as a pretty large gap in the industry, which was that all companies at that, at that time were focused on synthetically manufactured psychedelics. But we know obviously that consumers prefer natural products in pretty much all areas of their life. You know, they're not looking for more synthetic food coloring or synthetic supplements. And we believe that that preference will extend into the eventual psychedelics market as well. Uh, so we decided to start a company and in fact, focus just on natural manufacturing of psychedelic substances. We're still the only company that has naturally derived psychedelic drugs in clinical investigation. And being the first and only to do it this way has given us the opportunity to build a really good moat of IP. We have over 30 issued patents now covering all the different methods of extraction, formulation, standardization that, that we've developed. And our products are actually in quite high demand by researchers and a growing number of, of patients all around the world. Yeah, thank you for that summary. Uh, and I, I will circle back in a few moments to that, that focus on you know, botanically derived natural products. Uh, but you know, in terms of your uh, drug development focus, uh, you're focusing maybe on, on the end users of these products. Can you tell us why you're focused on substance use disorders specifically? We're focused on substance use disorders um, primarily because of the very large unmet need. Um, you don't have to go very far to read about the toxic drug overdose crisis in society. We're based in Vancouver, BC, which is unfortunately one of the world epicenters for the toxic drug crisis. Um, something like 8.6% of North Americans have some kind of substance use disorder. In fact, that they report having a substance use disorder to the government. And current therapies are um, tend to be ineffective, poorly tolerated, poorly adhered to. And in the case of stimulant use disorder, which is one kind of substance use disorder, there actually are no approved therapies. So we're talking about people with um, uh, addictions to cocaine and amphetamine type uh, stimulants. In the case of opioids, we obviously do have approved therapies, but these more or less are substitution therapies, right? Where you get prescribed a pharmaceutical grade opioid, um, which you can consume in place of your illicit opioid. And while these are proven to work and to save lives, they are also poorly adhered to. And what we're proposing with psychedelics, our natural psilocybin drug candidate PEX-10, is a potential solution to help people get off all opioids. And, and that's really what we're, what we're so excited about. There is a pretty large amount of historical clinical evidence of studies going all the way back to the 50s, 60s, and 70s before prohibition, showing psychedelics had great promise for the treatment of opioid addiction. And now modern research is showing um, the same thing. We have um, good published evidence in other areas of addiction, such as smoking and alcohol use disorder, showing that psilocybin can be highly effective against these quite difficult to treat disorders. So when you combine the very high unmet need, right, 100,000 people, unfortunately, are probably going to die of um, illicit drug overdoses this year in North America. The high unmet need combined with the lack of available treatments combined with the very high potential promise of psychedelics um, being efficacious in these disorders. All of those reasons combined are why our internal drug development focus uh, has been has been chosen on substance use disorders. Yeah, it's a, a really interesting strategy and, and obviously a, a very pressing issue for you know, society at large. Um, could you walk us through the drug development plan here? So you know, what's the process for uh, you know, the research and development into the eventual production and, and 
consumption of these uh, you know, botanically naturally derived drugs? So it's drug development, pure, plain and simple with the added wrinkle that it's a controlled substance in and of itself um, that we manufacture here in, in this facility in, in, in Vancouver. Um, our drugs are currently in the midst of phase two studies. Uh, we had a recent announcement um, that the FDA accepted our IND application, which is what's necessary to conduct uh, research under the auspices of, of the FDA, as, as well as Health Canada for our study in opioid use disorder. Um, we previously had a phase two study in methamphetamine use disorder, also approved by FDA. So once we progress through phase two, um, then it would be time for phase three studies. And once the phase three studies are completed at that point, um, what the next step in the process is, is to apply uh, for a new drug application to the FDA. And if the FDA approves that new drug application, then you have what's called a marketing authorization, the ability to actually market your drug for the uh, chosen indications. Um, based on our internal uh, research and, and that of um, consultants that we've contracted, we actually um, forecast an addressable patient population of over 800,000 people in stimulant use disorder and around 300,000 people in opioid use disorder. And this takes into consideration the amount of patients that are in North America, um, the amount of people that would have access to treatment, the amount of people that would have insurance and that would be willing to be treated by a, um, a, a new therapy such as what we're proposing. And nonetheless, you know, these are potentially very, very large numbers, which, you know, shows the need for these kinds of treatments and also the, you know, big potential uh, commercial implications uh, in, in a successful launch. Yeah, so you mentioned the, the FDA approval as a, as a crucial link in that chain. Um, you know, is there an equivalent uh, approval domestically within Canada or is the goal of this to cover, you know, both the U.S. and Canada? Most drug development uh, starts in the U.S. because I shouldn't say starts that most most drugs get approved starting in the U.S. first, because obviously the United States is a much bigger market. Um, but there is an equivalent process in Canada for getting a drug approved. Um, so typically companies will get a drug approved um, in America first, and then they might go to the EU and Canada and all these other jurisdictions, you know, in order of you know, commercial uh, implications or ease of getting in getting the product approved. A good example is MAPS, now Lycos, um, who are the sponsors of MDMA therapy for PTSD. They recently submitted a new drug application to the FDA um, uh, with the goal of having MDA approved in America, which is obviously very exciting for everybody. Um, so it, it stands to reason that you know, if they're successful in getting their drug approved by the FDA, they will probably relatively quickly move to get their uh, submit to have their drugs get approved in other jurisdictions as well. Right. Makes sense. Thank you for, uh, for explaining that. Uh, you're shifting focus a little. Um, you know, we touched on the advantages of uh, naturally derived products. Uh, you, you recently uh, exported botanical psilocybin uh, to Israel as, as a kind of landmark shipment. Can you walk us through the advantages of you know, this drug development approach and, and specifically the focus on naturally derived medicines? Sure. Um, the, the FDA has something that's known as the Botanical Drug Guidance. And this is actually a recent guidance that was published in 2016. Um, and it describes the development pathway for what are known as botanical drugs. And botanical drugs are a specific kind of drug that are derived from a natural source, but that also contain all of the primary and secondary metabolites from the plant. As you can well imagine, in magic mushrooms, there is much more than just psilocybin. Just as if in the cannabis plant, there is much more than just THC. Just like in the coffee bean, there is much more than just caffeine. A botanical drug includes not just the primary compound, but the secondary compounds as well. And this provides, the, the fact that the product contains many compounds provides a several different benefits. Number one, 
uh, we may see an efficacy benefit, right? So after all, you know, these compounds evolved in nature over millions of years to be present in the plant. And it's very possible that by acting together, they can have either kind of some, maybe some kind of a synergistic effect or that on a standalone basis, these other secondary compounds can be effective. So that's one thing that we may prove out over the next couple of years. Um, in addition, however, the presence of these secondary compounds uh, making a complex product makes the product very, very hard to replicate, right? It, you can imagine that if your drug product contains just psilocybin, for example, it's very easy to copy just psilocybin. But if your product contains psilocybin, psilocin, baocystin, norbaocystin, a dozen or more other compounds, known and unknown, this makes the product pretty much impossible to make an exact replica, especially when the starting genetic source material, the strain of mushrooms that we start from, is kept as a closely guarded trade secret. And the technologies that we use to transform the mushrooms into a pharmaceutical grade drug product, those technologies are actually all patented. So in this way, we think that we can um, maintain exclusivity of our drug product much longer than what would normally be possible with a single small molecule drug. And there's a couple of examples of pharmaceutical products that were able to maintain marketing exclusivity in this way. They weren't necessarily botanical drugs, but they were complex natural mixtures that over the years evaded any attempts of, mating, may, of having synthetic replicas made of them. Yeah, really interesting to hear that you're not just from a consumer preference point of view, is it advantageous, but also maybe from an eco efficacy perspective and an intellectual property perspective as well. Sounds like there's a, you know, a lot of advantages to pursuing this approach. Could you walk us through uh, you know, some of the key partners and, and your supply program when it comes to uh, developing and delivering these drugs? As I mentioned before, our drugs are in fairly high demand. Um, we, through our academic outlicensing program, have uh, 28 authorized clinical studies in seven different countries. You mentioned we just completed the first export of botanical psilocybin into Israel. Uh, we have studies in the UK, in Sweden, in Denmark, all around the world, the obviously United States and Canada. And we do this for a number of reasons. Uh, number one, it's a way of giving back to the psychedelic research community. Of course, you know, all psychedelic companies are, you know, in large part um, uh, basing their efforts on academic studies that have been completed in, in years and generation past. So it's important, we think, to give back to this community. Um, but in addition, you know, these different groups are researching indications that we may not be focused on internally, and they also help us build our safety database. When we go apply for regulatory approval, the government is interested to know all of the different times that our drug was um, administered in the clinic. If we have a very large database of safe exposures, then the government will give us uh, an easier time with our, with our own application. So it's a way of generating good favor with the academic community it's a way of getting more safety data and it's a way of generating more data in in new indications if we could wrap up you're know, looking ahead through 2024 uh what can investors expect in terms of updates from filament health and why is now a good time to be paying attention to the story well now is a great time as we embark on our drug development in substance use disorders uh, we continue our FDA development program. Uh, we commence our studies. We start having data readouts. Um, we're expecting, obviously, hoping for very good results for all the reasons I, I mentioned earlier. And we're already seeing that the, the industry is probably at a point where it's turning around a little bit after the last couple of years of being a very tough place to be. Uh, we're seeing different companies raise substantial sums of money, uh, continuing on their own drug development efforts, focused more on psychiatric indications. And we're looking forward to probably the very first um, pharmaceutical authorization of a psychedelic drug in, in MDMA. So it's very exciting times to get into the, into the psychedelics industry if people have been watching for the last couple of years. Well, certainly sound like there's lots in store for Filament Health this year. Ben, it was great chatting with you. Thanks so much for joining us today. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me.